What's up everybody? So this past weekend, we had our boot camp training uh, for our insurance company. And with that, we brought all our new agents uh, into town. And it was really cool this time because the majority, if not all of these agents came uh, from relationships on Facebook. That's how they first found out about the opportunity, um, whether they were following me on Instagram or Facebook, and then ultimately ended up uh, getting contracted with our uh, company. But one thing that I'm most, most proud of with our company is our culture, the culture that's been built uh, by the founder since day one and that I've been able to help build uh, along the way. And in this video, you're gonna hear a speech that we gave at the very end. Uh, it was by my business partner, Joseph Caldwell, the CEO of our insurance company and it just speaks to that culture in the very best possible way uh, so I'm excited for you to see it for you to get to know him better and get to know us as an organization a little bit better and to the Republic for which it stands because you may have come up in an age or, or you may be the age yourself where you were taught this is a democracy it's not it's a Republic all democracies have gone by the wayside in a short amount of time. And you hear it all the time. All the time. God, it is. Democracy, it's, democracy. it's not a democracy. Right. It is a republic governed by law, right? And 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 Caesar Rodney is one of my favorite, favorite historical characters. I'm gonna run through his story real quick, and I'm gonna tell a drop in the rock story, and we're going. So back when this nation was getting on its feet, um, you know, there was British rule, and, and, and all of us have learned in the history books, no taxation without representation, the shot her around the world, um, threw, off, threw off British apprentices. Does anybody know what the tax rate was that we were so pissed off? Five, three percent. It was three. Yeah. Three percent. Three. <laughs> Man, what a slippery slope. Yeah. But we knew what would happen if we just cow right? And, and... One of my favorite stories, my favorite character, Caesar Rodney, is, is about when the 13 colonies, they had to have a unanimous vote. I mean, you guys know that they only had, of the population living here, only 30% supported them. The rest of them were British loyalists, right? And most people don't know this. And so, of the delegates, there was three from each colony. And it had to be a unanimous vote, which means two from each colony had to vote, yes, we're going to plunge this nation into war with the most powerful country on this earth. And throw their oppressive tax of 3%, all of us, and tell King George, give him the finger. You guys realize that only 30% said they supported it. You know only 5% showed up to fight. So the delegates, it's called the Delaware Deadlock. If you look on the quarter today, the Delaware Quarter, it's a picture of Caesar Rodney. And nobody even knows who he is. So the Delaware Deadlock, they're voting. There's only two delegates there. One's a yay and one's a nay. So they go, we have to get the third delegate. So he was 90 miles away. So the reason he wasn't there was because Caesar Rodney had developed a serious cancer of the face and throat. He had sold all of his worldly possessions. The delegates in those days didn't get paid for it. They weren't career politicians, they were businessmen who had a stake in the game. They should tell us where we should go back to. They had a stake in the game. And Caesar Rodney had sold everything. And the only doctor that could help him and that could save his life, it was a last ditch effort, was in England. He had already taken all the money he had got from selling everything he had and he had paid for passage and sent the payment to the doctor for treatment. And he was leaving within that month. So he wasn't at the, he wasn't at the meeting to vote because he was at home sick in bed. He lived 90 miles away. They sent riders. 
and said, we, we've got to get, we've got to get to his boat. They sent riders to him. They got there. He rode. It was torrential downpours. He rode two horses into the ground. Killed two horses coming back. When he got there the next day, they literally had to carry him in. He was draped across two people. They carried him in. And, they, and, and when it came time for him to vote, what did he vote? Yeah. Take him home. Yeah. Yes to freedom. Yes to our freedom. What was he signing when he signed that yes? His death sentence. His death sentence. <clears throat> could, never, could never go to England. In fact, he was an outlaw. And his story rocked me to my core. Because when I heard it, there's no way I was committed that much to anything. Nothing. Nothing. I went, where are those men? Where are those women that do the right thing and sign their own death warrant for the right thing? And I went, man, I'm going to become one of those people. i got to be that person. And if you become that person, because you can be who you want to be, I don't care what you've done in your past, you can be who you want to be. And if you are that person, guess what shows up in your life? More of those people. More of those people. And I went, man, I want to be a Caesar Rodney. And, and lo and behold, Caesar Rodney's started showing up. Nathan and Jeff, Tyler, the whole leadership, this organization. I promise you there's a Caesar Rodney sitting in this room. I promise you there's probably more than one. Probably more than one. Um, and so that was my that was my that was my goal to become that. That was what I wanted. And, and along the way, I learned how, how I have to be forgiving. I have to forgive there, let go of the past, because it will steal everything in my future. Any of my successes, I had to let those go too. Successes in the past will steal your future. Isn't that crazy? And the, and the last story, which is, which is another one of my favorite, favorite stories, it's 1614. And there's a little tribe called the Wampanoag Confederations, the Wampanoag Nation, up in New England. Has anybody heard of the Wampanoags? Huge Indian tribe in, in New England. It's 1614. They were a peace-loving tribe. And, and Thomas Hunt showed up on the coast of New England. 1614. Thomas Hunt, for lack of a better term, was a son of a bitch. <laughs> he was a bad dude. He was a bad dude. When he showed up, there were 24 braves. He showed up to trade, is what they said, him and his men. He showed up to trade with the Indians in 1614. And so they sent 24 of their finest braves out to the ship because the ship housed the goods. So they took their stuff out there, 24 of their, of their braves. One of these was Tisquantum. That was his name. Young, 18-year-old, around, wife, kid, one on the way, right? And, and he, was, he was, I can't remember what they called it, but he was like the special ops guy. He helped protect the chief in there in Patuxent, which was his village. And, and, and when they went out, when these 24 braves went out to the ship, in good, in good faith, they let them down below the ship to look at the goods. And you know what they did? Tom Sunk pulled up anchor, locked them in the belly of the ship, and took them for slavery. Let me tell you what, I don't know what's happened to you in your life, but I've never been sold into slavery. 
That's a serious issue and one that you could carry as a rock for the rest of your life, right? They take these braves over to Spain. It was a huge, I can't remember what it's called in Spain, but it was, it was a huge market. And part of the market was the slavers market. It was a place where you could go and get everything from whatever you could get, you know, by anything. And so Thomas Hunt took them, took them there to sell them into slavery, selling these braves into flood slavery. And as the sun was going down, the story, the, the <laughs> it's kind of an embracing history. You can, find, you can still find it. But we're not taught this stuff, right? Have you ever heard the story? No. So, so as the sun's going down, up on the slaver's block, they're selling to spawn them. And, and they make them turn around, you know, they're half naked, they only got a loin cloth on, how, how, how uh, you know, turn around like this. And a Catholic friar is walking away from the market. And in his journal he wrote, he heard somebody say, turn around and look. And he was like, he thought, he thought somebody had seen, he's like, what, huh? And he turns around, he's like, what is that? He turns around and starts walking again. And he hears, turn around and look. And he turns around, and that's right when they're selling Tisquantum, and he's turned like this, with the sun going down behind him, and this thing just lightning rotted through this, through, through this friar. He went, that looks like Jesus on the cross. Right? And he goes, and he hears the voice say, by him, get him. I mean, Catholic friars didn't buy and sell slaves. You didn't know this, right? They didn't operate in that world. In fact, they were super condemning of that. And he buys that slave. Unheard of. Over the next little bit, he, they set him free. They teach him English. He stays with those friars and works with them. Even though he's free, he learns English, and he learns about Christianity. Isn't that crazy? And I think that's probably, it had to be where he learned to, to let go of some stuff. Because if there's anybody I would hate is somebody that stole me and sold me into slavery, I would probably carry that rock, right? I mean, everybody in the room, think about it. Take your complete freedom from you. Take you from your young wife, your kids. Think about it. I heard you talking to your kid today. Little girl? Yeah. How old is she? Eight. Eight. Can you imagine? Never seeing her again. Lock these doors up and we sell you into slavery. Makes your blood boil. Makes <laughs> your cry. Right? No, I heard you talking to her, man. It was like, it was super emotional for me hearing you say the stuff. You were so far, like it was, I got emotional listening. And uh, so, he, they, you know, they pay him money to work, work with him. And he, he gets, he, he, he makes enough money and learns English and, and gets hooked up with a, with a um, merchant in England, makes his way back to England from Spain, gets hooked up with a merchant, and, and pays passage to go back and agrees to work for this merchant to get back to his family. So some French, in between 1614 and 1619, which is when he got back, five years. <laughs> Can you imagine? Sometime in 1618, some Frit French sailors hit the same coast. And one of them has a disease. And what they think it was was some kind of viral hepatitis that was, that was easily, con it was very contagious, transferable in water, and it wiped out 75% of the Wampanoag Nation. It wiped out 100% of the Patuxic Village. A hundred percent. He had no idea. 1618, his wife and kids were already dead. And he's still working on getting back. So can you imagine when he gets back in 1619? 
and he makes his way down. He, he came into Newfoundland, Canada, and made his way down to Massachusetts on the coast where the Patuxent Village was. Can you imagine going back in there and the only thing left is bones? It's completely vacant. And it was taboo. No Indians would even settle in this area. Like, it was, it was desolate. Does he have a reason to carry some rocks? Do they have a reason to be angry and hateful and want to want revenge? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So in the winter of a couple weeks before the winter, he hooked back up with the um, Massasoit, which was the chief of the Wampanoag tribe at that time, what was left. And he started working for him. And In 1620, there's a couple ships, Mayflower and Santa Maria, and they tried to land hundreds of miles south, right when they're trying to land, a storm, this is in the Light of the Glory by Peter Marshall, you can read it, read it. a storm out of nowhere comes up and blows them up, they couldn't land. They couldn't land where they wanted to land. Blows them up, goes. This happens two different times. And so when they were finally able to land, about three weeks before winter, they land at the exact spot where that Patuxent village was. At the exact spot where that village was. You guys do realize that there was some unrest had they landed anywhere else, what would have happened to them? The Indians probably would have killed them. But that was like a safe haven. They landed there. And we all know that place as Plymouth. That's what they named it. And so then they were so smart, they hauled off and started starving to death. They landed a couple weeks before winter, and they, they hauled off and were starving to death. 1620. So, come the springtime when they're eating their shoes, eating the leather off their shoes for food, Massasoit gets an idea because there's a warring tribe near there that he's, he's nervous about that's going to wipe out the rest of the Wampanoag Nation. And he says, if I, if I can make a deal, if I can make a deal, because they the Wampanoags had heard of that there was people there. They weren't scared of them because they were all starving to death. And so Massasoit sends Tisquantum and, and, and coming into springtime in 1621, literally, the pilgrims are there and out of the woods walks this Indian. And you know him as Squanto. He walks out of the woods and he goes, Hey, my name is Tisquantum. You know what Tisquantum means? What it literally translates as. He said, Hey, I'm the wrath of God. <laughs> <laughs> literally, that's how his name translates. So he walked out and said, Hey, I'm the wrath of God. That's how his name translates. And he makes a, and he makes friends with them, and you know the story. He shows them how to farm, and they bring food for them, and that is what our country was born out of. Can you can you imagine? Can you imagine if he carried that that those rocks, killed them all? Can you imagine? Sold into slavery. There's a lot of other stuff that happened to him. I just don't have time to tell it all. But he had he had every reason to carry that sack of rocks. That's why we talk about that. The stuff that we carry around that keeps us from our future ain't so big a deal, right? It's not that big a deal. 
And he was the savior of the pilgrims. And he went on and he led a very peaceful and happy life. It's a crazy story, right? I'm pissed off I didn't know it already. I got a lot more you don't know. There's a lot more. There's like the education system. That's it's an indoctrination system, it's not well, an education yeah. system. But anyway, that's a different that's a different topic. It's a different topic. But I tell you that to go whatever it is. Right? If you never work with us again, if you leave here and never sell a policy, I want you to drop your rocks. Whatever those things are. Whatever is hindering you from your future. If you never do anything with us, I literally, it is my life's goal to get people to drop those and find what they want in life and go get it. To let go of the thing. The world does not need people to make more money. They don't need better job satisfaction. The world doesn't need Trey Carter to just sell more policies. The world needs Trey Carter to come alive, to live a life fully alive. And the only way to do that is to drop that stuff and to get rid of that stuff. Whew, that's about all. What's up guys, if you have not yet done so, please like my Facebook page, then next to the like button, click following, which will bring a drop down, and when it says in the news feed, click see first. This will ensure that you will always see the content that we're pushing out. The last thing that we wanna have happen is for us to put out content that you actually want to see, but you don't. So make sure that you hit see first, and we'll see you next time.